On Tech News Today, a sweeping new authoritarian law in China extends the Communist Party's grip on China's internet. Plus, Facebook and Google win in court and Apple loses. And we'll show you the new extended trailer for the upcoming Steve Jobs movie. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, July 1st, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is ZDNet contributing writer Kevin Tofel. How are you doing, Kevin? I'm good, Mike. I almost didn't make it. I was uh, plugged into Beats 1 Radio trying to go the whole 7x24 and just listen nonstop, but I'm here. Somebody's got to do it. You know, I I'm <laughs> having so much trouble with that. I can't get it to play on my laptop, on my Mac, MacBook Pro. Um, it just won't play. So uh, who knows? It's probably doing me a favor. Um I'm hearing all kinds of weird things about it. And uh, I'm also finding that the service is just very strange. When you first go in there and you do the Beats uh, mm -hmm. selection, to, you choose the red balloons to decide what sort of music you listen to. It then uses that information to show you the people you said you liked uh, under the, uh, the the Connect feature, or yeah, the Apple Connect feature. And it's 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 like... Only one of the people has a has a has a you know a stream. So I, I literally have one band uh, <laughs> when I look at it. It's all very strange, and we've actually got some some uh, news related to that uh, that service as well. But uh, how are you enjoying Apple Music generally? Well, I was actually a Beats Music subscriber way back uh, about a year ago, so I find it very similar, obviously, because really it's, this is Apple's twist on what they purchased. I think they spent $3.2 billion for Beats. Um, so that whole pick the uh, genres and artists with the red bubbles, I've, I've done that before. It was a little strange. It takes some time. Um, the Beats 1 radio is not really my style of music, uh, but that's okay. It's pretty interesting to me that everybody in 100 countries is listening to the same music at the same time. And, uh, you know, so far it's okay. I'm again, to me, the biggest disruptive feature is the $15 family plan for six people. So yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to be signing up for that as well. I think I'm going to try it anyway. Uh, and you, you zeroed in on the, on the fact and all this that I don't think we started talking about when we first, uh, were reporting the news that they're going to have this BBC one like radio station, mm. uh, which is that, it's the globe. It's the closest thing we've ever had to a global radio station that every you know, lots and lots of people will listen to. It literally is likely to have higher listenership and simultaneous, more or less, and live than any source of music ever. I mean, I, I can't think of any sort of uh, situation like this when you you can imagine a million people listening to this at once. Oh, or, easily, or, or, or easily. Yeah. yeah. So that is a kind of a weird thing, and it certainly gives Apple a, a lot of power to decide who listens to what and, and what gets sold and so on. So that is an interesting attribute of this. Well, speaking of places where there are lots of people, we got some news coming out of China. China's authoritarian crackdown can, under President Xi Jinping continues. The country enacted a new law today that may drive some international businesses out of the country and further suppress the Chinese people. The provisions in the new law are vague, as are the punishments for violating the law, but generally call for radical increases on government propaganda in news reports and greater government control over public opinion. This includes what the law calls national security education in schools and a crackdown on harmful foreign cultural influences. The new law also enables the government to further control all key network infrastructure and information systems. To those of us in the West, Kevin Tofel, I think this is kind of like a head scratcher because, uh, mm. you know, you'd think, well, don't they control everything already? Aren't the major publications all government publications? Doesn't the government already ex have the great firewall of China and so on? But no, this law uh, is, you know, of course, China for, for a couple of decades now has been trying to balance the control and the stability of a single party communist uh, party ruled country against the economic benefits of a kind of capitalist system. And they, 
you know, they're trying to balance these two things that don't really go together very well. And uh, under the current president for the last two years, this has been a, a pretty aggressive swing toward the old school Communist Party control. I, I guess they figure that they're wealthy enough already. And, uh, and, and this, I think this is, um, I don't think they, the, the elites, the people who are enacting this, uh, th this new set of laws, I don't think they realize the risk they're taking with the economy. I think they're going to enjoy mm. the, the, the control that they'll get. And of course, I think to, to a certain extent, this is a, uh, a reaction to revelations about the degree of NSA surveillance of the Chinese uh, population and government and so on. But uh, what are your general thoughts on this, uh, this unappealing turn of events? Well, I, I mean, I, I think it's a shame for the, the population of China, of course. Um, you mentioned what the, the government is trying to balance against. I think they're also trying to balance against the rest of the world that has a generally free Internet. Yes, there are um, obviously countries that still have similar um, limitations on, on what type of content can be out there and so on. But, you know, around the world, we're all connected. The globe is getting smaller. And that's a really tough position uh, to, for China to fight against. Um, so that's that's issue number one. The other thing is, um, I think in the long run, this is going to hurt companies such as Google, which are already on the outs in China, and the uh, network makers in China that people don't buy their equipment. Uh, in the U.S., we tend to stay away from networking equipment from the Huawei's and the ZTE's. And I think with this, we'll, we'll probably stay away even more. So will other countries. Yeah, and the, the old, uh, you know, five, ten years ago, the, the thought was, man, you got to get into China because if you can just get a tiny percentage, any percentage mm -hmm. of that enormous market, you're going to make a ton of money. And now, you know, we're looking at the country and not a whole lot of uh, non-Chinese companies are making a ton of money other than KFC and a couple of other, you know, uh, countries, uh, companies like that, maybe a car company or two. It's really not that lucrative a market considering how huge it is because the the system has already favored uh, Chinese brands, Chinese companies, and under these new laws, it's going to further favor those things, especially in the realm of internet and technology. So, well, Donald Trump's going to fix it all. So he'll don't fix worry. it all. He stood up to China. I saw an interview with him. He said, <laughs> I stood up for China. And they're like, how did you stand up to China? And he, he sort of skirted the issue. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, uh, he, the comedians must love the fact that he's running for president. I've got some more news for you coming right up. But first, let's talk about Blue Apron. Blue Apron, you know, this is only for people who like good food. If you don't like good food, don't pay attention to this ad. Blue Apron will send you a box once a week with three meals for two in it, or if you have the family plan, significantly more than that. It's a refrigerated box with fresh, locally sourced uh, ingredients, including spices, all the stuff that you need to make your own food. Yeah, you have to chop your vegetables and all that stuff so it's freshly chopped. This is a great service because it basically not only teaches you how to cook, but it will introduce you to types of food that you may not ever have considered making in your own kitchen. They'll never send you the same meal in the same year. And these meals take about 35 minutes to prepare on average. And they're around 500 to 700 calories per person. And uh, experts source only the best seasonal ingredients. And that's really the, you know, there, there's so many attributes to Blue Apron that I could talk about. But the thing that's most important to me is the fact that the food is so delicious. They do all kinds of really interesting things, too. There's very elegant uh, and efficient uh, recipes. They'll actually have you taking something like a lime, which they'll, of course, provide to you. And you use a part of the peel for one part of the ingredient. You use the juice for another part of the ingredient, uh, another uh, dish that you're making. Really good and efficient use of, uh, of the ingredients. And of course, since they send you exactly what you need and nothing more, you're not going to be throwing food away. They'll send you exactly what, you, what you're going to use and you use everything they send you. Really, such a great service. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. You can check out this week's menu, and you can get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right, two meals free for just going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. Why don't we uh, go to our next story here? Uh, an appeals court ruled against Apple and affirmed that Apple, in fact, fixed ebook prices. Jeff John Roberts wrote about it for Fortune and joins us now. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Hey, Mike, good to see you. Good to see you, too. We have a giga -ohm reunion here. It's uh, a lot of fun to see these guys chatting before the show. But, uh, Jeff, can you review what this case is all about? How exactly did Apple conspire to fix ebooks, ebook e prices? Oh, my goodness. Uh, some of your longtime listeners probably remember this because I think you and I talked about it years ago. Yeah. Um, 
Remember when Steve Jobs first introduced the iPad, then a radical new technology, he wanted to get some books on there. So he cut a deal with publishers saying, hey, I'll let you price them as you like. Then you can cut out Amazon by coming on to my iPad. Um, not too surprisingly, people said this was price fixing because the publishers got together with Apple and changed the pricing system. That led to a very high profile trial. Um, the publishers all folded their cards and settles and settled, but Apple um, kept fighting and is still fighting apparently, and they keep losing badly. And uh, yesterday was yet another ruling against Apple. On the upshot this time, though, is based on that settlement, uh, that means Apple will have to pay out $450 million via a class action suit. So if you bought, uh, if you bought books on iTunes, you're likely to get some money or credits from Apple sometime in the next year or two. Hey, Jeff, uh, Kevin Topol, it's good to see you again. Haven't talked to you since uh, our Giga days a few months ago. Uh, I had read the information on the case uh, yesterday. I saw the $450 million settlement and all. And if I remember, Apple actually started giving back some credits uh, last year. And as you said, they kept fighting this case. I mean, what is their defense here? What, what are they saying that they didn't do here? Because it's pretty clear what they did do. I think Apple's annoyed because, you know, books are real sort of small time for Apple and are even less so now than they used to be. And it's a bit odd if you think of Amazon, how dominant they are in that market, that Apple's the one that's being sort of put through the legal ringer. And I think what they're saying is, you know, we should be able to price as we like, uh, and this helps competition. So the legal issue turns on whether doing this is automatically an antitrust violation or if you should look at whether harm resulted. And you could say, wait a minute, this probably helped getting someone beside Amazon into the game. But I mean, this is sort of uh, done and settled. The publishers gave up the ghost a long time ago. Apple keeps losing. And, uh, and, but yet, I think at this point, they're just sort of, it's a, uh, I'm trying to think of a non-curse way to say it, contest between uh, Apple and the Justice Department. The, uh, the average uh, viewer or listener to this show and anybody who's been following this news over time may wonder why it's price fixing for Apple to conspire with publishers to make sure that uh, nobody can undercut Apple prices. Whereas for Amazon, it's not uh, anti-competitive for them to sell below their own cost in order to uh, suffocate the market, essentially. That, it's, it seems like uh, that is another, to me, if, as a layperson and a non-lawyer and somebody who, who, um, who's just looking at the fairness issue of this, it seems like uh, selling it below your own cost and below everybody's cost uh, and losing money in order to I presumably eliminate competition. It seems like that's eliminating price competition as well. Why is it, why is what Amazon does okay and what Apple did is not okay? Well, there are two different types of antitrust issues or monopoly issues. I think you're quite right. The dissenting judge yesterday said exactly what you did. Wait a minute, Amazon is selling below cost to keep other people out of the market. And that's sort of a form of dumping that should be illegal. However, um, under the law, what, Amazon, what Apple did was worse because they colluded with others and organized a conspiracy. I guess it would be like if you're selling a tech news show and you want to price really low for your ads to keep others out, you could do that. But if you got together with the other tech news producers and fixed the price, that would get you into trouble. Maybe it's a silly analogy, but that's the distinction they drew. Also, that Amazon is basically a retailer. They can sell whatever price they like, whereas the publishers are suppliers and when they banded together to fix the price, that was offside. Jeff, as you noted, um, Apple just keeps fighting this. I know they, they already lost a similar case back in the EU, I think in 2012, and made concessions there. At this point, I mean, what, what can Apple do? I mean, can, I, they can continue fight, fighting, but I mean, what, what would be their next steps if they wanted to do that? Well, uh, Kevin, I mean, I, I miss having you around for these mobile questions because you know the space so well. Um, I'm trying to get inside Apple's head and I can't quite figure it out. Perhaps their lawyers just keep egging them on because they've now hinting they might appeal to the Supreme Court. I'd be very, very surprised if that, if that happens or if the Supreme Court takes the case. And in the meantime, they're just really ticking off a lot of Justice Department lawyers and what they hope to win out of it, I don't know. I mean, they can afford to fight. They're Apple. But, you know, politically or strategically, um, you know, why do they care? This is ebooks. This isn't their turf. I guess there's the pride 
issue, but you know, at some point you'd think they'd cut their losses. Maybe, you know, you guys have some insight. I don't get it myself. Well, if you do figure it out, you should probably write an ebook about it. Good <laughs> luck selling it. Uh, Jeff John Roberts is at fortune.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Jeff John Roberts. Thanks for joining us today, Jeff. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kevin. Good to be here. A Vienna court has thrown out a class action lawsuit against Facebook. It was brought by Max Schrems, who charged that Facebook illegally tracks users and cooperated with the NSA surveillance program. Uh, and uh, joining us to talk about this is Paul Gillingwater. Welcome to you, Paul. Howdy, Mike. Uh, pleasure to be on. I'm so glad you're on. Now, uh, we need to start by saying that uh, this is a class action lawsuit that you are participating in, right? Exactly. I signed up in the early days of this. Um, not so much for the money, but because I wanted to see what was happening and get an insider perspective. The money bit would be nice, too. Uh, now, on what basis did they toss this out of court? Yeah, in this case, um, it helps to have a little bit of context. And part of that is that Facebook, as you know, has nearly 1.4 billion users. 80% of those users are outside of the U.S. And that means a large part of those users, 80%, are managed through their subsidiary, Facebook subsidiary in Ireland. Now, the court ruled that Schrems was, although he was able to bring the, the suit in the court, the court argued that it didn't have jurisdiction. And they argued specifically because Schrems had allegedly used one of his two Facebook accounts for professional reasons, and therefore, under Austrian law, couldn't be considered to represent a consumer because he was a professional user of Facebook. Paul, so what can Schrems do now? I mean, is it uh, can he take it to another country's court or 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 re uh, submit the uh, the case as a consumer user of Facebook? What are his options now? Oh, he'll definitely be appealing this. Um, Schrems is be, is no stranger to court action. Uh, some of you may be aware that uh, this started back in 2011 when Schrems first brought suit against Facebook in Ireland directly under European privacy law and was able to get a printout of his entire Facebook file. He was the guy who pioneered this. And so they had to send him a couple of thousand of pages and a PDF of all the Facebook information, which was uh, available on Max Schrems himself. So he'll be taking this to appeal for sure. He's disappointed by the ruling. Um, he knows, however, that he's in it for the long haul. He's made it clear that this is just the beginning. He's been doing this for a couple of years already. He's not making a cent out of this. So it's not a financial motivation. He truly is a passionate advocate of privacy. And of course, he's using uh, Facebook itself to promote his uh, Europe versus Facebook advocacy group. Uh, he knows a, a good thing when he sees it. Uh, now, one of the interesting attributes of this story is that the number of people who are represented by the lawsuit is around 25,000, if I, if I'm, if I uh, recall correctly. But a huge number of people wanted to join, and, and they basically capped it at 25,000. First of all, what is the total number of people who wanted to join this class action suit, and why did he cap it? Well, he kept it primarily to keep it manageable. Um, but in fact, there are a further 55,000 who have already registered to join at a later stage. One of the things with these types of lawsuits is that you have no real restriction on when you can actually participate. In fact, you can join the lawsuit up to the last day in court. But they've capped it for the initial 25,000, primarily for administrative reasons. And so it's a nice round representative number. Now, if this if there is a judgment at 500 euros per person, 25,000 people, it's only a 12.5 million euro payday, which is around 15,000, uh, 15 million US dollars. The interesting thing about this is it's being funded by a German specialist legal funding agency, which will take a 20% cut if they win the suit. Very strange. Very, very strange. Paul Gillingwater is at thelocal.at. And you can follow him on Twitter at A-H-B-L-E-Z-A. -E Thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. You're very welcome. Thanks once again. All right. Microsoft is continuing its rollout of the Intel-based Surface 3 tablets that come with built-in LTE. The tablet will become available to business customers Friday in Germany and in the UK. And in the coming weeks, the tablet will made, be made available to commercial resellers in France, Germany, the UK, and in the United States and if you want more information on the Service 4 with LTE, stick around after this show for Windows Weekly, where Mary Jo Foley will go into all the details around this news. Kevin Tofel, are you looking forward to this? Is this going to be a, a popular device? What do you think?
Well, to be honest, I do like the Surface 3 device itself. I think the problem that I have is the cost. And I think a lot of people uh, have the same issue. You know, once you start out at $499 and add a keyboard, there's another $100. And now if you add LTE, it looks like that will add another $100. So, I mean, it's very nice to have LTE in your mobile device, without a doubt. Um, it's just... And it, it, the price adds up really fast on the Surface Surface 3, to be honest. I also think it's interesting that they have such a slow and gradual rollout of this uh, device. If this were Apple with a new iPad, they'd, you know, they'd ship, you know, 10 million in the first month or something like that in huge numbers internationally. Uh, so we'll see if they succeed with this uh, strategy and with this product and at that price point. So, uh, again, stick around for Windows Weekly after this show and you can get more details on that product. Well, in product update news, YouTube's mobile apps for both Android and iOS have been updated to enable videos to play at 60 frames per second, which is great because this show and all Twitch shows are uploaded at 60 frames per second. That's why they look so awesome, Kevin Tofel. <laughs> and so here, there's, a, there's an example. <laughs> that, that's hilarious. It's so smooth. It's silky smooth. It's amazing. Actually, our live feed does not show it at 60 frames per second, only the downloads play at that frame rate. So, uh, yeah, still silky smooth, though. Well, Apple updated GarageBand yesterday. The most unexpected features that artists, uh, the most unexpected by me, I didn't expect it, uh, is that artists on Apple's Apple Music Connect service can publish directly from GarageBand for iOS. Other new features include 100 new electronic dance music and hip-hop synth patches and also a new transform patch smart control for customizing synths also has support for force touch. Um, <laughs> Kevin Telfo, how many artists do you think are going to upload to connect directly from their iPads uh, after having created their music on GarageBand? Well, I'm going to get my jam on right after the show and start uploading things. I, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> it's it's nice that Apple does put out these publishing tools. Um, it was unexpected to me as well that to see that you could have uh, direct publishing from GarageBand. But you know, that's been a, a main staple of their of their software products for years now for musicians. So it's actually nice to see it, it gain those new features as well as the Force Touch, which I, I don't know what you can do with it. Um, and obviously, you'd need one of the new MacBooks that have a Force Touch trackpad. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 we'll see how many people take advantage of it. Yeah. Well, in courtroom drama news, Google won a court case in Germany yesterday. A German performing rights organization called Gemma wanted to make YouTube pay each time uh, users watched music videos by the artists it represents. And the court says, nope, Google doesn't have to pay. So I guess that's... No surprise there. Yeah, no surprise there. I guess that's mm -mm. good news for people who don't want to pay for stuff and certainly for Google who wants to continue to show the music videos. Well, hang on to your butts, folks. In News You Can Lose, the full Steve Jobs trailer is finally here. The movie stars Michael Fassbender as Steve Jobs, Seth Rogen as Steve Wozniak, and also has Kate Winslet and Jeff Daniels. Danny Boyle is the director, and most importantly, the screenplay was written by Aaron Sorkin. Let's watch the trailer. What do you do? You're not an engineer. You're not a designer. You can't put a hammer to a nail. I built the circuit board. The graphical interface was stolen. That's Steve Wozniak So how talking. come 10 times in a day, I read Steve Jobs as a genius. What do you do? Musicians play their instruments. I play the orchestra. He looks and sounds nothing like Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. Here, you've been worse than usual this morning. I didn't think that was possible. He's a great it's actor. It's a system error. Fix it. Fix it? Yeah. We're not a pit crew at Daytona. This can't be fixed in seconds. You didn't have seconds. You had three weeks. Here's a great the line right here. The universe was created in a third of that time. Well, someday you'll have to tell us how you did it. <laughs> Ooh. I'm begging you to manage Earn. expectations out there. You see how this reminds you of a friendly face? It's warm and it's playful and inviting and it needs to say hello. If you keep alienating people for no reason, there's be no one left for it to say hello to. Your Apple stock was worth $441 million, while your daughter and her mother are on welfare. She's not my daughter! You must be able to see that she looks like you. You're issuing contradictory instructions, you're insubordinate, you make people miserable. Even if that were true. Doesn't sound that diabolical to me. We 
spoken to the fire marshal and the building manager. They're going to come in and tell everyone to leave. If a fire causes a stampede to the unmarked exits, it'll have been well worth it for those who survive. The board believes you're no longer like never necessary to this company. I sat in a garage and invented the future because artists lead and hacks ask for a show of hands. You're going to end me, aren't you? You're being ridiculous. I'm going to sit center court and watch you do it yourself. Make everything all right with Lisa. Fix it. All right, there it is. Well, Kevin mm. Tofel, this is Aaron Sorkin we're talking about. So, of course, the character in this movie is nothing like the a person actually represented. We call the takedown that was the social network where uh, Mark Zuckerberg was completely uh, uh, slandered and libeled and all that kind of stuff. Uh, to have it, they made him mm -hmm. into a super bad guy, um, basically fabricating all kinds of stuff about him. And, uh, you know, for example, they, they suggested that Facebook was created as a reaction to uh, Mark Zuckerberg getting dumped by his girlfriend. In fact, his current wife was his girlfriend throughout the entire uh, period. Mm -hmm. they, they suggested that he created this hot or not app that uh, was all about a bunch of uh, frat boys judging women when, in fact, the thing that he created was both men and women. Uh, it was a hot or not type of thing for both men and women. Etc. And so this is, I, I fear, going to be another takedown mm -hmm. where the dialogue is nothing like Steve Jobs. The, the history is probably going to be wrong. And uh, it's a real problem around somebody like Steve Jobs where we are so familiar with every detail of his life. And so still, it's like The Social Network, despite all the flaws, is probably going to be a good movie. I'm sure to watch it. I've read several of the uh, Steve Jobs books and, and so on. And I think you're right. I think this is going to be a little less uh, realistic than one would hope. I'm, I'm not too keen on the choice of actors here. I don't think they're good representations of the characters, but I'm not saying they're bad actors, just maybe not for these roles. Um, so we'll see. When does this come out, Mike? October 9th. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll be sure to report on it if any more trailers come out or, or uh, when this movie comes, we'll certainly do a little mini review. I will personally do that, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, we got some email from Robert Silver uh, about a report yesterday that Europe is moving to ban roaming charges, and Robert wrote, great story, and the elimination of roaming will have far wider implications than just the end user pricing. Many people experience poor coverage, which could be improved if they could roam to other national carriers. Now, what can stop someone from finding the cheapest deal in the EU bringing the SIM to their home country, and then roaming happily between carriers. This will further drive the multitude of carriers in Europe to consolidate in order to compete. Huge ramifications. That is a really interesting point, again, from Robert Silver. We also got an email from Jacob Huff, who wrote to address my hope that Tech News Today is banned in China. Jacob wrote, Mike, I've been living and working in Shanghai, China, for the last four years. I'm sorry to have to tell you that TNT and the Twit Network are not blocked in China. But if it makes you feel any better, it will be if an official ever watches it. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Jacob. He said, keep on keeping us informed. And again, I, I do appreciate that. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Adrian Arroyo, who posted this picture on Twitter. He watches tech news today v using AirDrop via a Raspberry Pi for some reason. Nice. Yeah, I guess just to prove that he could really do it. Show us how you watch or listen to Teen T. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup or your Raspberry Pi and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Kevin Tofel, what the heck are you working on? Uh, when I'm not writing at ZDNet.com this week, I will be uploading my entire Beatles catalog up to iTunes so I can have it in the new music app uh, since there's no Beatles streaming yet. Very, very nice. And you can follow <laughs> Kevin. You should follow Kevin at Kevin C. Tofel on Twitter. Thank you so much, Kevin. We'll see you next week. Sounds good, Mike. Thanks. All right. You can subscribe to Tech News Today at twit.tv slash TNT. And you can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1700 UTC at twit.tv. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how to do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on the social media side of your choice. Tag three friends and recommend that they subscribe 
You can also subscribe to our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com. You can follow me on all the social networks at elgin.com. And don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every single weeknight. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. The show is produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.